Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Kutsia Hugo, and I am from Bloemfontein, South Africa, the physics department at the University of the Free State. And the two mentors that I'm having is Professor H. C. Swart and Professor J. J. Terblans. Today, I will be presenting a talk on the applications of OJ and XPS at our department at the University of the Free State. So the outline will be on the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of the systems that we are having, and then on some of the applications that we, we use OJ and XPS for, and then some research questions that is uh, very important for us and why we really do OJ and XPS, and then a very short conclusion. So introduction on the systems. The systems that we're having, we're having an OJ um, system, which is the Phi 700 scanning OJ nanoprobe. And the XPS system is a Phi 5000 scanning SCOM microprobe. Micro -probe. We bought these two systems um, in 2009. We have them both under one roof at our National Nano Surface Characterization Facility at our department. And um, I am the scientist working on both these systems. The clients that we do measurements for is mainly from our own university, our own faculty. And then we also do measurements for other universities as we are a national facility. And then also from other research institutions and also from the industrial part. Then the fields of study. So what is the fields that we do measurements for? We do for physics, chemistry, microbiology, geology, pharmacology, zoology, and also biotechnology. We mainly do measurements on powders and thin films and then some, some strange vacuum friendly objects now and then, but we don't do those strange objects a lot. We are mainly focusing on powders and then thin films. So the application, what do we do with OJ and XPS or why do we use the two techniques or the two systems? So we mostly answer some surface science questions. And if we talk about the surface, we talk about the uh, topmost atomic layers from the surface, which is less than 10 nanometers from the surface of the sample. And then the manner in which any solid surface interacts with the environment or with another surface is forcing us to investigate the sample surfaces. And then answering certain questions about the composition, the structure, the luminescence, and the chemical state of the topmost atomic layers is crucial in understanding many technological processes. Some examples of these processes are chemical reactions like oxidation and corrosion, catalysis, adhesion, thermoionic emission, crystal growth, segregation, and also erosion. So why do surfaces possess certain optical, electrical, or mechanical properties? And then OJ and XPS are highly specialized surface science techniques that help us to answer some of these very difficult surface science questions. Some examples of these surface science research questions that we, we most of the time get and what we have to answer. Um, one example, the first example is the composition of the material. So we do survey scans with OJ and XPS, and then we identify the peaks that we are getting. Most of the times, the clients exactly knows what material should be in there. Then it is easy to identify that, but sometimes they're not sure. Um, and then we can assist and we try to locate or identify what are the peaks. So we just do a survey scan on powders or thin films or some structure materials, and then we identify the peaks and then we can tell the composition. At our department, we have a very strong phosphor group. So phosphor is a luminescent material or a light bearer material. And uh, most of the time, the students do or make or synthesize our own phosphor powders. And then we also make our thin films. And then it is very, very important to confirm the composition um, of the samples that they made, the powders and the thin films, because that in turn affects the luminescence and Sometimes something goes wrong with the synthesis, then there's some impurities in there or some annealing takes place and then the oxidation state or the valence state of the materials are not the same anymore. So then it's important for us to identify the composition. Another research question that we answer is the distribu distribution of the materials on the sample surface. So we can do with OJ and XPS, we can do elemental maps 
So with scanning OJ microscopy, but we can also do maps with XPS. Um, most of the time we do it with our OJ. So this is an example that we had to do for a client. And the question was, where is the indium? So what was happening here? Um, indium, indium antimony quantum or nanodots um, were grown on gallium, gallium antimony substrates. It was grown by metal organic vapor phase epitaxy, and it was studied for detector applications for solar cells. And then the clients wanted to know if they succeeded into growing the nanodots on the substrate. So we could show them with OJ maps that they've indeed succeeded. So if you look on, on the images, the one on the left is the same image, and then the one on the right is then the same image. So indium is red, antimony is green, and then the substrate gallium is blue. So the indium antimony nanodots were very successful, successfully grown on the substrate. Another research question on the distribution is where is the cerium? So did the cerium affect the morphology was a question that was asked for these clients. So what we have here is zinc oxide doped with cerium phosphor powders. It was synthesized by the chemical bath deposition method. And then the influence of the cerium three plus as a dopant on the crystallization the surface morphology and the optical properties of ZNO were investigated. The addition of cerium influenced the morphology of the samples. It changed from a flower-like structures for the undoped samples to pyramid-like structures at high concentrations of cerium doping, for example, 10 more percent. Then with OJ maps, we could show that the pyramid structures contain ZNO doped with cerium and that the cerium accumulated in some areas more than in other areas of the sample. The undoped and the lower dope concentrated samples showed green emission around 559 nanometers, and then the higher serum concentrated sample showed blue emission at 436 and 503 nanometers. So the intensities decreased with higher concentrations. The band gap reduced from three electron volt to 2.4 electron volt, for the undoped and the 10 more percent cerium doped samples. And the change in the band gap clearly affected the luminescence. So the clients or the authors then suggested that the band gap that influenced the luminescence might have changed due to the change in the particle structure from the flower like uh, structures to the pyramid like structures. Another question that we ask and answer with our systems is to identify the nanoparticles. So what is the quantum dot? So I'm using the same example as previously for the, for the surveys. So we can, I can put my OJ beam on the nano dot and then I can identify the particles. So we can identify nanoparticles, the same, doing same and surveys on it, but we cannot do identify nanoparticles with XPS. And another example to identify nanoparticles was um, yttrium oxyfluoride dote with bismuth, five more percent. So this, this research was done for specifically for solar cells. And then um, there was, if you look at the same image, you can see that there's spherical particles that are agglomerated in some areas and some areas are whiter than others. So the first thing that the clients want to know is what is these nanoparticles? Can it be maybe the bismuth that accumulated to some areas? And then I can put my beam on the, the small nanoparticles and I can show them the, the surveys and then identify the peaks that they're having. So it's also part of composition, but composition on nanoparticle scales. Then we can also answer research questions that include the thin film thickness. So what is the thickness of the nanofilms? So we can do depth profiles, both with OJ and XPS. And then we can calculate the thickness. If you know your sputter rate, then you can convert your sputter time to the thickness of the thin films. Then also the composition of the thin films. This is also very important. So sometimes you get a layer looking like this after it has been annealed, for example, then on this side, you have your sample surface. And then on the right side, there is your substrate. And then in between, there's a mixed layer. And then we can identify the composition of the thin film. Yeah, we can do it both as OJ and with XPS. Then something that's very important that we do with our XPS system is we answer some um, 
questions regarding chemical effects. So what chemical changes occurred, for example, during degradation, during annealing, during changes in synthesis parameters and um, exposure to gas or radiation. So, and then normally there's a variation in the luminescence. So then why is there an emission vari variation? And then we can use our XPS to answer some of these questions. So the first example that we're gonna look on the effects of the chemical effects on the chemical side. So the answer or the question that was asked is why did the photoluminescence of strontium fluoride doped with europium three plus show the broad band emission with narrow sharp emission peaks. So if you look at the luminescence um, graph on the left hand side, you can see you can see sharp small peaks over here and then there's a broad emission band on the left hand side. So we did XPS on this, and then we saw that the XPS high resolution peaks showed us that there were two oxidation states for the europium. So the europium three plus must have reduced to europium two plus during the synthesis procedure. So, and this was then the reason for this broadband emission, <coughs> excuse me, on the left hand side, um, that was coming from the two plus inter configuration allowed it 5D 4F transition. Another example of a chemical effect. So the question was asked, why did the blue emission of yttrium silicate doped with cerium change to almost white emission? If you look at the image here on the right, this was a, a photo that was taken. So the before the degradation, the light was blue. And then after some electron bombardment, um, the light of the color changed. So something must have happened and then XPS could help us. So XPS showed the formation of a luminescent SiO2 layer on the surface. If you look here at the graphs, on the first two graphs, the one on the left is an example from the powder. There was a commercial powder that was bought. It wasn't synthesized. So it already contained a small part of SiO2. And then this was the undergraded thin film that was made. You can see that the SiO2 part was also there. And then after some 24 hours degradation, you can see a small increase in the SiO2. But after some six days degradation, there was a large increase in the SiO2 peak, showing that us that they must have grown a luminescent SiO2 layer um, that affected the, the light. So during the SL, the cathode luminescence studies, the SiO2 peak increase. And then the SiO2 layer must have formed during electron stimulated reactions that affected also the shape and the color of the light. So the SiO2 must have then emitted due to the formation of defect levels under prolonged electron bombardment. Another example of a chemical effects and questions that we answer is on a sample known with yttrium oxide doped with bismuth three plus phosphor powder. So why did the PL intensity of the yttrium oxide phosphor powders increased with annealing temperatures? So this yttrium oxide doped with bismuth powders were prepared by the combustion process for solar cell investigations. Investigations were done in order to see if the samples PL intensity could be enhanced through annealing. And then the intensity indeed increased and then it decreased again after 1,400 degrees Celsius. XPS showed that the bismuth three plus segregated to the sample surface. So, so this caused an increase in the luminescent centers near the surface. And then at higher temperatures, the bismuth three plus evaporated from the surface. So this in turn reduced the effect of concentration quenching, so the intensity is higher. At 1,400 degrees Celsius, the bismuth concentration was too low to be detected by the XPS, but the concentration was still efficient enough to result in a very high emission intensity. Then the last example that we answer on some chemical effects is what is the origin of the red emission in zinc oxide nanophosphors. So zinc oxide nanoparticles were synthesized by the combustion method for visible and ultraviolet light emitting diodes and for lasing devices. Two different ZNO nanoparticles were synthesized, the ZA sample with zinc acetate dihydrate and a ZN sample with zinc nitrate tetrahydrate. XPS then showed a O1 peak due to ZNO 
bonding in the Wurzeit structure of zinc oxide, an O2 peak due to the O2 ions that are in oxygen deficient regions within the ZNO matrix or and in zinc and OH groups. Then an O3 peak was labeled um, due to chemiabsorbed species such as CO3, adsorbed H2O or O2 on the surface of the zinc oxide due to contamination. The O2, O2 peak is therefore due to the formation of oxygen defects and or oxygen interstitials. So the O2 peak for the Zn sample has a greater area compared to the Za sample. You can see the one on the right is the Zn sample. So the O2 peak has a greater volume or area in comparison to the Za one. The PL then showed that the Zn sample with a higher defect concentration showed a higher red orange emission with a lower UV emission. The reason is that hydrogen that was used to make the ZA sample can passivate the defects like in the ZA sample and therefore reducing the visible emission and enhancing the UV emission. So the key year that we could have um, discovered from the XPS was that by using hydrogen, hydrogen can passivate the defects and that was only showed by using XPS. So in short, the conclusion, we, we mainly do OJ and XPS to answer certain research questions. And for our own department and for other clients, national and international, we have a very strong force for group under leader of Professor Schwart and Professor JJ Terblans. We most, mostly synthesize our own phosphor powders and make our own thin films. We investigate in detail the composition, the crystal structures, the luminescence, the morphology, some chemical aspects of certain aspects like degradation, for example, or annealing. And then OJ and XPS is very important for these investigations for our phosphor applications. And then through this, we contribute to a large field of new surface science research results. I thank you.